You guys ready for the, the word of God today? Um, thank you, Josh. I'm going to do, I'm going to deviate from our series um, intentionally. And um, with the, the events of the week, obviously, if you're a part of our church family, you know, we suffered an incredible loss this week. One of our worship leaders and, and dear beloved friend, Randy, um, stepped into the presence of Jesus and received his eternal reward. And that was not the outcome that we were expecting, praying for, or hoping for. And I just felt in, in light of that, um, that I, just the message that I had, which is a really good message, was not was not fitting because I, I felt like as a pastor, I wanted to, to try to help because I understand in our church, you know, let me say the family's doing well, God is speaking, God is moving, God's already doing miraculous things through such a great tragedy. Um, but I also know that in church and in Christianum, when things like this happen, there are a lot of questions and people ask questions and people question doctrines and beliefs and, and all that's, that's pretty normal actually. Um, but because of that, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that I have answers for all the questions. I think as a pastor, I think I'm, I'm wise enough to, I no longer try to answer questions that God isn't answering and God does not answer all of our questions right? Um, I wish that he did because I've got a list too for when I get to heaven. Like, oh, Peter, thanks for letting me in the pearly gates. Where's the throne room? I've got questions, right? Um, so I have my questions too. Um, and so I think sometimes as pastors out of our, out of our heart of compassion and love, we actually we want to bring hope or peace, and so we try to come up with answers to questions that God isn't actually answering, and sometimes in doing that, we actually cripple people's faith and sometimes create confusion and sometimes just create bad belief systems, even though the intention was wonderful. And so I've just decided I don't, I was on the phone with a family member the other night, uh, Pastor Mark and I were at the hospital, and this, they asked me a question. And I just said, I wish I could answer that, but I cannot. I wish that I could, but I cannot. And I will not make up something that's really not going to help anything just so I can feel better. And, and so I wanted, just as I prayed, uh, and we were at prayer Saturday, the Holy Spirit just began to, to download some things into my heart. And I went to the office yesterday afternoon and tried to get them all on paper. And, um, and so I just want to share some things. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 9 today. Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 14. And it says this, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around. So Jesus and the, and the three amigos, Peter, James, and John, have come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and uh, there's a commotion. Verse 15, immediately when they saw Jesus, all the people were greatly amazed, running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing? And then one of the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. And he answered them and said, oh, faithless generation. I do want to make the comment that faithless is probably not the correct or the best, um, the best translation here. It would actually be unbelieving or unbelief. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long? And the reason I want to say that, and I'll probably get back to this, is there is a difference between having no faith and having unbelief. Right? So having no faith is one thing. Having unbelief is something else. You can have faith and unbelief. Hopefully I'll come back to that. That was just enough to mess everything up, but I'll come back to that and fix it later, okay? Um, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him, the boy. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. That's quite a scene. I mean, this is worse than your two-year-old in the cereal aisle. Does anybody know why children lose their mind in the cereal aisle? I'm just, anyways, maybe you never had that experience. You didn't take your child down the cereal aisle, but Dad, the sugar fried butter, please, Dad, just give me this. 
It has a toy. No, we're not getting that. And then it's like, <laughs> anyways, Sarah, I'll... I love Jesus' response. You got to see this. The demon throws this boy on the ground. He's convulsing. He's seizing. I mean, this is, this is dramatic, traumatic. And Jesus kind of looks at the dad and says, so how long has that been going on? <laughs> now, I think the demon acted that way because it worked on the disciples. A uh, secret to breakthrough is when you become unimpressed at what the enemy can do. Right? Once you become impressed with the enemy, it's hard to see breakthrough. Um, so he asked, how long has this been going on? And he said, from childhood. And often it's thrown him in the fire and the water, destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. And Jesus said, if you can believe... All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Case in point, look, two things are present, belief and unbelief, faith and unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many thought he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and arose. Verse 28, 29 is really where I want to spend my time. But, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? So he said to them, this kind come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Um, I'm going to give you my title in just a minute. Before I do... I could understand with if you've been in church any amount of time that me reading this text on the heels of what we walked through, you probably have an idea of what I'm about to say or how I'm going to use this text. What I would say is you're wrong. So what I'm asking is don't decide what I'm about to tell you. Just listen and let me tell you. Does that make sense? Can you all do that? Um, it, I tried to figure out a title uh, for this message. I thought about when breakthrough doesn't come, but that sounded not so much good. It didn't sound good. Um, and then I thought about the crisis of faith, which I kind of liked better. Uh, but I landed on this, and this is what I'm going to call it, deconstructing disappointment. Deconstructing disappointment. So let me pray. Holy Spirit, um, we need your help, and we need your words. So you speak today and help us to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you've been hanging out, listening to podcasts, on social media, whatever, you've heard this phrase. It's kind of a new, it's not really a new word, kind of a new phrase. Deconstruction. Deconstruction. And um, what it is referring to is we have a generation, really it starts with my generation, so after the boomers there's the X generation and the millennial generation and the Z generation. And a lot, of, a lot of the people who were maybe raised in church and who were taught certain things in church have come to a place where they feel like their experience is varied from or has departed from some of the things they've been taught as absolutes. They're having different experiences and seeing different things. And, and it's causing them to this kind of become a, a new exercise, I guess would be the best way, is to deconstruct their faith, to look at their faith through the different lenses of what they believe and what they've experienced. Um, and they have started deconstructing their faith. Now, I think part of the problem is that the church has never been the best at allowing questions. Um, and because of that, we've got generations that had hard questions and want to ask hard questions, and maybe we're discouraged from it, or maybe we're shamed for it. And so sometimes as the church, we become, we, we have doctrine, and then we become dogmatic, and then we're intimidated by questions sometimes that we can't answer or that go against our own dogma. And we haven't made a place for questions. And now we have uh, generations of people trying to figure things out outside of the church instead of inside of the church, um, and, which is dangerous. I think the church has to be a place where we can allow questions, even if we don't have 
the answer to those questions, we can still allow questions. I think sometimes, honestly, from a pastor, we don't like to not have answers because it goes against our own pride. Have you ever met somebody that always has all the answers? Then you've met an arrogant person. If you're around someone and they've never said, I don't know, get a new friend. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Anyways, that was bad, wasn't it? Anyways, but, um, but I think we have, to, we have to allow that. And I think it's situations like what we have just walked through that can cause people to ask some really good questions, but yet some hard questions. Now, you need to understand there again, God doesn't always promise an answer to all of your questions. But I think wrestling out your faith can be a good thing. In fact, I've said many times in many places in my own life, I have walked through what I would call a crisis of faith. When I have an experience that doesn't seem to line up with what I believe. It's a crisis of faith. It actually can become a helpful thing and a good thing if you handle it appropriately, which is what I want to talk about today. So here we have some disciples who three of them were on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration with Jesus, and they come down to this chaos of this boy who had a demon. His dad brought him. The disciples that were left, the other nine, were not able to cast him out. Now, I know a lot of us are thinking, well, obviously Judas wasn't going to cast out a demon, <laughs> but there were still eight others. <laughs> there was, that could be a scary thought, couldn't it? That probably Judas did miracles. Wrestle that one out. All right, so anyways, um, but here come the disciples, or here comes Jesus, and he is coming down this mountain. There's a commotion. There's a dad. My son, demon, brought him. Your, your, your disciples, they weren't able to help him, and, and chaos. And so here's what we have to understand. The disciples were the most successful deliverance ministers of the day. In fact, they were shocked that they didn't get breakthrough. I want you to think about that. Because if I have a prayer for our church, it is the day will come when we are completely shocked the miracle didn't happen. Instead of being shocked when it does. You see what I'm saying? And so they are coming like mountaintop experience, mountain transfiguration. We've been delivering people. We've been, and now they've encountered this demon and they, I'm sure, have applied their best practices. I can tell you as a pastor, I've been in this situation. I've been, I've, this may scare you. I have cast demons out of people. I've seen stuff that will blow your mind. I have been in the, the, the emergency room when a, in this particular case that I'm thinking of, when a two-year-old has not breathed for over an hour and laid hands on him and watched him come back to life. I have seen that. Unfortunately, it's so sporadic, I'm almost surprised when it happens. I wish it were the other way around. To be honest, with a little two-year-old boy started breathing and all the alarms went off because he was on a ventilator and all that, I thought I had killed him. I would love to tell you, oh, I had great faith. I floated in on a cloud and said, come back to life. I would love to tell you. No, no, no. I showed up saying, dear Jesus, please help me. And they said, would you come pray? And I said, I'll pray. I will apply my best practices. Amen. And I started praying. And all of a sudden, every alarm went off. And I couldn't even open my eyes because I thought, I've just killed the baby. And I opened and I looked at a nurse and said, what's going on? And she said, he just started breathing on his own. So I have, I have seen that. But I have also seen it not work. I've seen in, in the church, we went from the mountaintop to the valley, just like the disciples from the mountaintop to the valley. We, we had this incredible breakthrough with another one of our family, another one of our worship leaders, that, that it was a bad situation. Life flighted to Dallas, and, and, and God did a miracle 
in, in Kate. She's doing fantastic. Baby delivered at 27 weeks, but continues to grow and thrive. She sent us a picture yesterday. She was in the nursery holding the baby. It's, it's all the, every doctor that comes into her room says, wow, I don't even know how this is possible. And so I, I know... So what do you do when you go from the mountaintop and then it didn't work? What do you do? Well, the disciples, that's why I love the Bible because if you've got a question, it's in there somewhere. And I love Mark 9 because I've gotten more help from Mark 9 because of this story. And so, and so here's, here's, here's what happens. They come, they're not able to deliver him. Jesus delivers the boy. And I like, let me talk, can I just talk just a minute about what they didn't do? Because it tells us what they did do. So what they did do, verse 28 says, and they went, when they'd come into the house, they went privately and met with Jesus. I want you to think about that verse. In fact, put it up there, guys. Mark, Mark 9, 28. And it says, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? I, I, like, I like that. They came privately. Now, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Before I do, let me talk about what they didn't do. When they didn't, when it didn't work, when, when they didn't see breakthrough the way they had seen breakthrough, number one, they didn't accept it. They didn't accept this as the new norm. Are you with me? They, they, they didn't, they didn't, let me, let me say it another way. They, um, they didn't accept it as a new norm, one. Number two, they didn't believe that a lack of breakthrough was an indication of God's will. And that is to say that they didn't say, well, because we didn't see breakthrough, it must be the will of God for there to not be a breakthrough. They didn't assume that their experience was to teach them what God's will was. Their crisis in this moment was because God's will had been informing their experience. The danger we run into is when we allow our experience to begin to inform us of the will of God. And we begin to elevate our experience in a fallen world full of death, full of sin. And we begin to allow experience to somehow tell us who God is and what God wants instead of the word of God telling us who God is and what God wants. Now, they're also ministers, so this third one makes sense to me, in that they, they, didn't, they didn't create a new doctrine. They didn't create a doctrine around what didn't happen. Now, you're, you're not a church, you're a person, so let me spin it this way. They didn't create a belief system around what didn't happen. Well, sometimes God does it and sometimes God doesn't. Another thing they didn't do is they didn't blame God or Jesus. Is everybody still breathing? Y'all yes. still doing okay? Y'all still want to hear the rest of this message? Yes. I'm just, I'm not trying to be ugly. I, can I just say that list I gave you, I have done all of them. I've, I've thought about creating a new doctrine. I've thought about a belief system. I've thought about just accepting that sometimes it doesn't happen. I've, I've been upset with God about things that didn't happen that I don't. But so, so if you've done any of those, you're in great company because I'm there with you and I'm really good company. I'm a lot of fun. But I'm just pointing out they did none of those. Here's what they did. They took Jesus aside privately. Let me say something really quickly. <laughs> Number one, be careful who you process disappointment with. Yes. Amen. 
Be careful who you process disappointment with. They, they didn't, <laughs> we'll just use Judas for fun. They didn't call a meeting with Judas. They didn't get on YouTube. It's amazing to me sometimes as Christians, and I think we need to process, and, 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 and I, I process, you've got to have safe people to process with, but it's amazing to me sometimes as Christians, the stories I hear about people who, you know, they've got a problem in their marriage and they process it with their single friends. <laughs> They're having a problem with their child and they listen to their <laughs> sister-in-law who doesn't have children. Listen, I was an expert on children until Luke was born. And quite frankly, he was pretty easy. And so had we just had Luke, I might would be writing books about parenting. But God gave us Mariah. And she, was, she had terrible twos until she was six. I learned deliverance ministry on Mariah. That is why she is so sweet today. I finally got it cast out of her. These are jokes I won't be able to say in the next service because she'll, <laughs> she'll be there. Um, <laughs> but, but be careful who you process disappointment with. Be careful. Don't, don't process disappointment of issues of faith with, un, with people who don't believe. Don't commiserate with people of faith who have had a similar experience. Don't let a lack of breakthrough become your identity and find other people who are identified by the same lack of breakthrough and commiserate about it. I feel like this is very helpful, but you are looking at me like I just stepped out of a spaceship. You're scaring me. Stop it. Um, I just think, I think be careful who you process disappointment with. Sometimes we find more solace in the commiserating of our issue and receiving identity from it than deliverance from it. I, I have met people that would rather stay in. It's like, I'm just, can I just be honest? I found people that would rather be identified by what happened to them they, that, because that was an identity. They found solace in that and they just stayed there. And when you stay there, you, you find other people that stayed there too. So be careful who you process with. Second thing, be careful where you process disappointment. They did it in the presence of God. God, um, this is where my burden for the church, we have to allow questions. God allows questions. I'm not saying he answers them. I'm just saying they don't really phase him. They brought Jesus aside privately in the house. With Jesus, they decide, all right, we, we're disappointed. We're not sure what happened. What do we do? We run to Jesus. We process with Jesus privately in the presence of God. We ask our questions. That's why, as a church, we need to allow people to come to the house of God to, to ask, ask their questions. I'm not saying you get an answer, but you can't ask the question. Now, you need to understand. Look at Hebrews 11. Let me show you this. Hebrews 11, verse 3. It says this. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Do you see that? So, so that everything which is seen is made of things that are not visible. Everything which, let me say that, so that the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Okay, just, I said it the same way, but different version. All right, so anyways. But look at the first four words. By faith, we understand. By faith, we understand. <laughs> Understanding does not lead to faith. Faith leads to understanding. 
Th- this is probably my, my burden with the concept of deconstructing faith. Is that <clears throat> I think you should ask questions. I know we have crisis of faith. I've experienced those. But watch this. When I take my belief out of the arena of faith and move it into the arena of understanding and I try to analyze my belief with understanding and my experience, I'm no longer deconstructing faith. I am destroying faith. Because I have removed understanding from faith and now I'm applying my understanding to see if it will lead me back to faith. Understanding does not lead to faith. Faith leads to understanding. And by the way, it is the same for the atheist. <clears throat> what the writer of Hebrews said, he said, by faith we understand how the world was formed. Every atheist could say the same thing. By faith I understand how the world was formed. Because by faith, if I'm an atheist, by faith, I believe there was a cataclysmic, galactic accident and this world became in perfect order. I was talking with an atheist friend of mine one time and I told him, I said, I would consider the religion of atheism, but I do not have enough faith. And he said, what? I said, I would consider your religion of worshiping self, but I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And I gave him this verse. I said, by faith, I understand God made everything I see out of what couldn't be seen. By faith, everything that I see was created by a creator. It's the whole theory. You can't have a watch without a watchmaker. You can't have something that was designed without a designer, right? I said, by faith, you believe there was a galactic hiccup and a crash and sales came to order and creation came to order and this planet that is tilted just right, that if it changed one degree this way or one degree this way, some people would freeze to death and some people would burn up. And if the distance changed a mile this way or a mile this way, we would burn up or die. And I said, you believe that everything that I see is ordered and it's perfectly, you've had chocolate (laughs) and you believe that was an accident. (laughs) The cocoa plant was not an accident. It was designed by a creator who said, it is good, it is good. And I said, I would love to be an atheist, but I don't have enough faith because by faith, you understand how the world was formed through this crazy accident. By faith, I believe a creator created it. It takes less faith to believe in that when you study creation than to believe in what you believe, especially given I've studied it. There's actually no evidence of evolution that actually exists anyway. But the reality is, if the enemy can get you to remove belief from the arena of faith and apply understanding, he will destroy your faith. You have to take your understanding and drag it into the arena of faith and say, I will understand by faith, even if that means I don't understand. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart and I will not lean on my understanding. Sometimes trusting God is not understanding. We all want peace that passes understanding, but you cannot have peace that passes understanding until you give up your entitled right to understand. (laughs) Serving God gives me a lot of things, but it does not entitle me to understand everything. In this passage, what does the dad, let me say this and I'll come back to that. Here's the problem. When I remove understanding from faith and I put my belief in the arena of understanding, I'm yielding it solely to experience. 
It is not like, it's not being influenced by truth. It's being influenced by experience. In this passage, what does the dad think the problem is? It's not a trick question. Not a trick question. He brings the boy to the disciple. What does he say the problem is? A, a demon. We can't say demon. We don't believe in him. <laughs> A demon, right? The, right? What does Jesus think the problem is? Unbelief. Oh, unbelief. Oh, unbelieving generation. The dad thinks the problem's the demon. Jesus thinks the problem is, is unbelief. Remember when I said... You can have faith and unbelief. You can also have faith and fear. The one with the issue of blood was very fearful, but yet had the faith to go touch the hem of Jesus' garment. But in this passage, we see it because the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. He tells us, I have faith, but I also have some unbelief. I think sometimes in our lives, it's not that we don't have enough faith. It's that we have too much unbelief. Because the Bible, even Jesus said, it doesn't take a lot of faith to move a mountain. Just a mustard seed being the smallest seed, I think, that you can find is a mustard seed. Right? In fact, we see this miracle with this boy, and if there's a smaller amount of faith in the Bible, I can't find it because this man says, I believe, but I'm full of unbelief. I mean, that barely moves the needle. Yet, yet Jesus says, all things are possible if you just believe. What I have found is that our heart is soil. Mark 4. Right? Our heart is soil. Seeds do what seeds do when they are placed in soil. Are you with me? In the parable of the sower, he throws seed in, and in one seed it landed among thorns and thistles. What, what were those? Other seeds that had been planted in that soil. And those seeds became so great they choked out the seed of the word of God, which is where faith comes from. So what I have found is that the devil, the enemy, uses experience to sow seeds of unbelief in hopes that he can sow enough unbelief in the soil of your heart that it will overshadow the faith that is present. And the main way he gets his opportunity, in fact, remember Matthew 13 talks about this parable. This guy went out, he sowed a bunch of wheat, and then the, ser the service came back and said, we got a problem, there's tares growing with the wheat. And it said, while he slept, the enemy went out there and began to throw tares in with the wheat. And tares actually kind of look like wheat. They just don't produce the right fruit. They're, they're basically genetically modified fatherless wheat, so they don't actually produce seed, but they look similar to wheat. Some people, are, some people are watering doctrines that were never from the Word of God. They were sown in unbelief, but because they look like a doctrine, we'll hang on to it. But this is what the enemy, and I, I got to get on, but this is what the enemy does. And this is why it's so important who we process with and where we process, because when we have an experience that is disappointing to us, contrary to our belief, the enemy is going to seize that opportunity and sow as much of his seed of doubt and unbelief as possible. This is why it's so important who and where we process disappointment with. Um, so they come to Jesus. Hey, what happened? Why couldn't we cast him out? And I want to talk about Jesus' response. So verse 29, it says this. 
It says, and you know it, famous verse, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, I want to make sure we're all on the same page that in the kingdom of God, there are very few formulas. Very few formulas to break through because breakthrough comes through relationship, not religious formula. Right? Because people read the Bible and it's like, you know, fire in the Bible is always judgment. Well, it, it, except for that one time in Acts chapter 2 when it was the Holy Spirit descending on people and bringing life to the church. Well, earthquakes are always God's judgment. Well, it, you know, except for that one time in the New Testament when Paul and Silas were having a worship meeting at midnight and an earthquake came to deliver them. So it's just important that we don't always just apply blanket formula because remember, (laughs) he said this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. And I think what people do is they take that and then they say, okay, well, if I want to see deliverance, I have to pray and fast. Okay, here's what I want to tell you. The devil is not really, um, he's, he's not really concerned about fasting. Let me say it another way. He's not concerned about a hunger strike. I think sometimes he's amused by it. And sometimes when we think that that's what fasting is, I'm going to go on a hunger strike until God does something. Don't, don't fast food, fast air. Because it would be it'll go faster and yield the same result. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not saying you would die. I'm just saying if you hold your breath, like, you know, when your two-year-olds used to throw a fit and they'd hold your breath, I would always say hold it because eventually they're going to pass out and their body will start breathing again and it'll be over. Right? Right? So don't go on a hunger strike. Go on an air strike. You know, it'll only take a couple minutes. You'll be right back and you'll see it didn't work. <laughs> I have done a lot of hunger strikes is how I know all this. What I'm amazed is that Jesus said this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting, but then he neither prayed nor fasted. But he delivered the boy. We assume when he says this kind, he is talking about the demon. But what did he say the problem was? He's not telling them how to get deliverance. He's telling them how to get the unbelief that was just sown in their hearts by the experience they had out. In my experience, there are three categories of unbelief, three places where unbelief are sown or unbelief is sown into our lives. Number one, the place of ignorance, meaning I just don't know. I don't know the word of God. I don't know the will of God. I don't know what God wants to do. So anytime I don't know, faith begins where God's will is known. Anytime I don't know God's will, I am open to seeds of unbelief because someone else can tell me what isn't his will. This is why the Bible is so important. It tells me the will of God. Like for me to say I don't know the will of God is really not a good excuse because I've been given the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and and the Bible. I should be able to discern the will of God, right? The transforming of my mind, Romans 12 said, leads me to be able to discern the perfect and pleasing will of God, acceptable, perfect, pleasing will of God, right? So the Bible tells me I should be able to discern the will of God. So the first place unbelief comes from is the place of of I don't know. It's ignorance. There's nothing wrong with ignorance. You can cure ignorance. That's, you know, we've all been ignorant. We're ignorant of things today. They're just things you don't know. Again, if you know everything, then what you may not know is that you're prideful, right? So, right? so we all have places of ignorance. We all have places that we don't know. Uh, the second area of, of unbelief is discipleship. Some of us were taught to not believe. Now, it wasn't put that way, I mean, unless you're an agnostic or an atheist, you can be discipled by them. But in the church, a lot of times we were, we were taught doctrines like 
sometimes God does things and sometimes God doesn't do things. Sometimes God wants to and sometimes God doesn't. It works for some people and it doesn't work for everybody. Well, God's not a respecter of persons. God's will is absolute and set. So if, if we're not seeing it, right, we don't want to create a doctrine. Can I tell you the hardest place to get breakthrough is when people have fortified their, their experience with walls of their own understanding? Now just think about what I just said. Sometimes the, the hardest place to see a breakthrough and sometimes the hardest place for people to come back to trust and faith in God is when they've had an experience and they've got unbelief and they've fortified and they've protected their disappointment with the walls of their understanding. And in the church, sometimes those are doctrines. Are y'all still with me? So, so sometimes unbelief comes in because I don't know. Sometimes unbelief comes in because I'm taught wrong. And then sometimes unbelief comes in because I've had an experience contrary to what I believed. When Jesus says this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting, I don't believe he's talking about the demon. I think he's talking about the problem, which was unbelief. And what he sees is when unbelief, when that seed is sown, the faster we can pull it out, the less time it has to put roots in. And I think what Jesus sees is these disciples are going to have to lead the church. Peter's shadow is going to have to heal sick people. And I've got to teach them now what to do when it doesn't work. Which is not accept it, be mad, create a doctrine, change belief systems. It is to say when it doesn't work, you can bet the enemy has come to sow tares. And you've got to go to work to remove the tares. This may be the best message I've ever preached in my life. And I'm just as shocked as you are. <laughs> and so he says, we have to uproot this. Now, what does he give them? This time comes out by prayer and fasting. It is not a hunger strike that uproots belief or unbelief. It's encounter. Faith is anchored in the unseen Unbelief is anchored in the seen. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Paul said, don't look at the things which are seen, because the things which are seen are temporal. But he said, look at the things which are unseen. Just think about getting this letter from Paul. You'd have thought he'd been hitting that communion wine too. <laughs> don't look at what you can see, look at what you can't see. Okay, Brother Paul, <laughs> I'm feeling you, bro. <laughs> How many times y'all do communion this weekend? <laughs> Face anchored <laughs> in the unseen. What does prayer and fasting do? It makes me aware of the unseen. That's what it's supposed to do. Prayer and fasting is to say, I will set less emphasis on what I see. I will not focus on what I see. I will not focus on the food that my body naturally craves. I will set my face and my affection and my focus on a world that I cannot see. So what Jesus says is, listen, when those seeds are sown, you come privately into the presence of God and you press in for encounter with the world that you can't readily see because the world that you do see has been informing your unbelief. You need to come back into this realm of the world you can't see and let it uproot unbelief and inform your faith. So he pushes them into encounter. Authority and power come from encounter, more so power. Authority and responsibility technically come from the commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. That's responsibility and authority. But after he told the disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize them, that was responsibility and authority, right? The Great Commission, follow me. Great Commission. But he said, now, before you go into all the world, go to Jerusalem and wait until you're, what the word actually is, clothed with power from on high. 
So power came not from the commission, but from the encounter. Are you with me? So here's what Jesus knows. I can only flow in power to the degree that my heart is settled in faith. Unbelief unsettles my heart. So he says, this kind of unbelief comes out. See, the other kinds come out by teaching. This kind comes out by encounter. Like, I don't know God's will. Jesus, seeing the crowd, he would sit them down and teach them. Teach them. Why? What's he doing? He's removing unbelief. Why? By teaching. Because they don't know. Right? Wrong doctrine. What happens? We teach. Experience unbelief. What happens? We move back into the realm of the unseen for an encounter with the king. To recenter ourselves on the world we are actually from, from whence our power comes. I need to wrap this up. So let me say this. So what happened? What's the problem? Problem is an experience that, that was contrary to faith. What did, you, what did they do? They went privately into the presence of Jesus to process what didn't happen. What did Jesus do? He pushed them into an encounter. Into an encounter with the unseen. Why? Because they were now grounded in the seen more than the unseen. And he pushed them back into the unseen. Prayer and fasting. Back into the unseen. I want to say this. There's a few things I want to say, and then and then we'll go. Um, remember how I said Jesus said this kind of comes out by prayer and fasting, but he didn't pray or fast. It was because Jesus prayed and fasted into a lifestyle. So two things. I can wait until the next bad thing. I can wait until the next experience of unbelief and then pray and fast for the power to deliver or to remove the unbelief. Or I could do like Jesus and pray and fast into a lifestyle that guards my heart from unbelief and keeps me connected to power for breakthrough. I told you I won't give up on prayer. And so for me, what I've looked at is, I, I think when bad things happen, we should go, we should turn prayer up as high as we can turn it up. But I think we should keep prayer turned up even when bad things aren't happening because we don't know what's coming tomorrow. And we need, it, it's like we want to fortify our hearts from unbelief. And the way we do that is staying connected to the unseen through prayer and fasting, through staying connected to the kingdom. What I also see in this text, and I'll say this and then I promise I'm done, is that if we'll let it, loss can create greater hunger than victory. If you let it. Look what I'm saying. <clears throat> they had experienced victory. And that victory had never caused them to take Jesus aside and dig in deep. Right? But when they experienced loss, that loss drove them to dig in. And what I feel the Holy Spirit saying to our church is let's let losses cause us to dig in more, to pray more, to fast more. The victories will come. But let the losses create a hunger. Losses can create two things. Apathy or hunger. Acceptance or hunger. Let's let them create hunger. We don't have the answers. We won't always get all the answers. Not our job to get all the answers. Trust, 
faith, being anchored in the unseen and preparing ourselves for the next battle, for the next victory, for the next breakthrough, that, that's what we have. Taking Jesus aside, that's what we do. Being in his presence, that's what we do. Moving into encounter, that's what we do. And we say, you know what? We've had a loss and it sucks and I hate it, but you know what? It's making me hungry because I'm not gonna be content and I'm not gonna be apathetic and I'm not gonna change my doctrine and I'm not gonna change my belief system and I'm not gonna be okay with it. And it's okay to not be okay if not being okay drives me to encounter with God. You can stand. We'll end there. That seemed like a good place. Come on, will you lift your hands? Jesus, we, um, we just lean into you today. We, we lean into you today. We trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own, our own understanding. We trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come and I want everyone to take a moment and ask God what he's saying to you. One of my favorite things for us to do. God, what are you saying to us today? And with our heads bowed today and no one's looking around, let's take a moment with God. And, and first, I just want to make sure, I just want to check, you know, it's highly likely somebody would be here that maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And if that's the case, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love for us to pray with you and and so if that's you, and, and I'm not asking again if you've been to a church or I'm not even asking if you've ever prayed a prayer. I'm ba- it's your personal relationship with Jesus. Is it a good relationship? Not a bad relationship. Is it a good relationship? Are you on good terms, speaking terms? Are you talking to each other? Is he guiding your life? If, and if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I believe right now the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate that. The Bible says he will stand at the door and knock. And that can look like a lot of different things. It can be a feeling. Or it can be a sensing. It can be a knowing. It can be you just saying, you know what? I need a relationship with Jesus. That's you. We want to pray with you. And so no one's looking around. Heads are bowed. Even if you're online, don't, don't turn that off. It may be you. And so if you're in this room and you're like, hey, I need a relationship with Jesus. Would you just lift your hand up to Jesus right now and say, you know, God, here I am. And even if you're in your, yeah, God bless you. Thank you. Even if you're in your living room by yourself, just lift your hand up and say, God, here I am. Now, here's how we do this. When we dismiss service, people are going to be moving around. If you lifted your hand, I want you to come to the front. And the reason I want you to do that is because we want to stand with you. And um, we we don't want to just lead you out there to try to figure it out. We want to connect with you, serve you, make sure you have a Bible, get you connected to the church, all of those things. And so when we dismiss, if you lift your hand, I'm going to ask you to come. And then anyone who needs prayer for anything, we're going to ask you to come. We want to pray with you. And Father, right now, I pray for everyone in this room, for those that lifted their hands, God, I pray they would come and, and make a commitment of faith. If you're online, you can text my pathway prayer to 77977 and we'll pray with you that way and connect with you that way but God I pray if they lift their hands they would come God I pray for the rest of our church God today we choose to trust and we choose to press in for encounter to see your kingdom come and your will be done God, we don't, want to, we don't want to live for anything short of what you've called us to. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can you give Jesus one more prayer? So if you lifted your hand or you need prayer, we want you to come. Everyone else just say, big God bless you. We love you so much. We'll see you next weekend. 
Hey, welcome to Pathway. Pastor Marty here, and I wanna say how excited we are that you chose to join us online. It's incredible, and I wanna encourage you now to stay connected with us. We don't want you to miss any of the content that we offer because we believe in connecting people to purpose, and we hope that everything that we offer will bring encouragement and hope and strength to you as you follow Jesus. Uh, there's a few ways you can stay connected. Number one is subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then click the notification bell. You'll get notified instantly whenever we offer new content Content. Also, you can like us on Facebook um, and you can follow us on Instagram. We were so excited to have you. I believe God has incredible plans for you. The best is ahead.